Hey everybody, Dr. Rob Solomon here, Proven Health Alternatives. I've got a stellar guest today. You're gonna to learn all about functional neurology. Nobody knows the brain and its implications better than Dr. Matthew Antonucci. Doc, thanks for coming on. Hey, Dr. Rob, thanks so much for having me. It's always great. And you guys have some amazing people on your show, so I feel so privileged to be a part of it and be on it as well, too. Um, I'm really happy you're here. I wanna talk a little bit about you. Um, like I said, I'm really happy I could get you. So, um, guys, I'm, I'm going to synthesize his really great long bio here. Dr. Antonucci is an experienced chiropractic neurologist, functional neurology practitioner, researcher, and international lecturer with over a decade of clinical experience. He proudly has participated in the health transformation of patients and athletes from around the world with complex neurological conditions and performance challenges with individualized, performance-inspired, neurological rehabilitative programs. He is active in practice, and that's critical. So he's going to bring some clinical gems in multiple states, as well as an active instructor for the Carrick Institute, which I'm sure he'll explain to who he is. In my field, everybody knows who Ted Carrick is. Lastly, and he said most importantly, he's a loving husband and the father of five amazing boys whom he hopes to inspire to follow in his footsteps to help people and have a mission and a mantra. So Dr. Matt, what drove you into this? Oh man, you know what, it's chiropractic. That's what drove me into it. You know, in chiropractic school, uh, I just saw some really amazing things happen with patients that were getting adjusted, everything from allergies changing to, you know, migraines going away and it, all these different things. And I just started asking myself, like, what is the common link between uh, manipulating a joint and somebody's allergies improving. And when you start tracing it back, the only place you can actually get to a commonality is the brain. So I started really becoming interested and fascinated in the brain, started studying feverishly, started finding who are the best people in the world at brain, who's doing things that are helping people affect their brain and change their brain. And most importantly, who's doing it with these things, their hands, right? Uh, without drugs, without surgery, uh, and ways to actually affect people's brain. And, and that kind of led me to Dr. Ted, Ted Carrick, as you kind of talked about. Everybody knows who he is in our profession. Uh, so spent a lot of time with him, learned a lot from him, uh, and you know, really just got super passionate about it. Now it's my entire life. Without question, Dr. Carrick, if there's a Mount Rushmore of chiropractic, he's on it. Without oh, for question. sure. Um, so... Just tell us a little bit about the Carrick Institute, 60 seconds, and then we're going to really unwind you and unpack everything you're going to share on concussion. Which is sure. Yeah. The Carrick Institute about. is the largest provider of continuing education in the chiropractic profession. It's quickly growing in other professions. Uh, they offer over 6,000 hours of education. We've uh, trained over 15,000 doctors. Uh, been teaching doctors since 1978. Uh, we have courses in functional medicine. We have classes in uh, performance optimization, neurology, uh, radiology, you know, basically the gamut, but with all a focus around brain-based healthcare. So everything that the Carrick Institute offers always ties back to the brain because we know that the brain affects everything in life and everything in life affects the brain. So that's kind of the paradigm that we teach from. Well, let's dig in. You ready? I'm ready. What's the definition of a concussion? Everybody always asks me that. What's a concussion? So oh, let's well, start. you know what? The reason why everybody asks you that is because nobody really knows. There's actually 30 official definitions of what a concussion is, but there's no one unified definition. And that becomes problematic because if you have 30 different definitions of a condition, how do you know if you have it or if you don't? Uh, that also skews epidemiological studies. So we don't even know how many people have concussions because everybody's defining it differently. Um, and a matter of fact, there's a whole lot of controversy around concussion versus mild traumatic brain injury uh, and how they're phrased. You know, for example, if somebody told you, Dr. Rob, you had a traumatic brain injury, um, you, there's, it evokes a certain emotion out of you. Or Dr. Rob, you had a concussion. One seems more severe than the other. And what they're finding is that um, by calling a mild traumatic brain injury a concussion, you almost mitigate it, meaning that people are more likely to continue playing, go back to work, go back to normal activities, but also telling somebody that they had a traumatic brain injury also has psychological and psychiatric uh, aspects of it that actually have been shown to increase the odds of having persistent symptoms. So it's a very tricky thing, 
But concussions are mild traumatic brain injuries, and most mild traumatic brain injuries are concussions. Um, and when we start to define it, uh, the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine actually does the best job, in my opinion, at defining it. And what they do is they basically say that a mild traumatic brain injury is any traumatically induced physiological disruption of brain function with one of the following characteristics, a loss of consciousness less than 30 minutes. So if you lost consciousness for 29 minutes, um, you had a mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, loss of memory directly before or after, but less than 24 hours. An alteration of your mental state at the time of insult. So if you're a little dazed and confused and don't really know where you are, kind of forget what time it is, uh, that meets the criteria. Any type of focal neurological deficit, whether it's transient or not. For example, if, if you hit your head or hit any part of your body that induces uh, trauma to your head and you hear a ringing in your ears, that, that euphemistic getting your bell rung, or if you see little flickers in your eyes, those seeing stars, that is a focal neurological deficit, which meets the criteria. And also we talk about something called the Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, which is the most unified um, measurement of consciousness in medicine you know, since it was created in, in the 1970s, uh, a score of uh, not less than 13. So any one of those criteria, if you meet any one, meaning you don't have to lose consciousness, all you have to do is see stars or hear your bell, get your bell rung, um, you've had a concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. So could we call it, would you be satisfied with this and correct me, please? Traumatically induced transient disturbance of brain function. Yeah, that's a really good because that's the lowest threshold, right? Because if you lost consciousness, absolutely, it's transient and it could be transient or not. You know, it's, it may be persisting as well, but as long as you have a traumatically induced change in brain function, essentially you've had a mild traumatic brain injury. And TBI, every concussion is a TBI? Every concussion is considered a mild traumatic brain injury, um, but it depends. And like, remember we said, if you've had a concussion and it's longer than 30 minutes loss of consciousness, and you're now in the area of moderate traumatic brain injury. Um, so it's, it's, it's sufficient to say that every concussion is a traumatic brain injury, but not every traumatic brain injury is a concussion. Yeah, that's what I was gunning for that. I'm, I'm I told you my texts pop up. So first thing they said is, great tie, where's yours, Dr. Rob? Thanks, <laughs> I've gone tieless, but that's okay. He's wearing glasses and they look stellar too. Uh, second question is, um, where do I go? Who do I see to get if, a diagnos diagnosis of a concussion? Because for me, a lot of times when I go over concussion in the lecture, chiropractors are a little sketchy and a little concerned about diagnosis. So. I'm curious to hear what you have to say and um, where they may get trained for that. Yeah, well, so the diagnosis itself, like we said, it, it, you really shouldn't be so intimidated by it because there's over 30 different definitions, 30 different criteria. Um, so to, to tell somebody, hey, listen, I think you had a concussion. If they meet the criteria that we just talked about, like you, they had a, a, a rapid acceleration or deceleration of their body, doesn't have to necessarily be their head and they had some transient neurological symptoms that are not explained by pre-existing conditions, that are not explained by drugs or alcohol, that are not explained by medications. It's kind of an exclusionary criteria. You can say that you know, you, you, your patient had a concussion. Now, um, I guess there's two perspectives here. The, the person that's asking, I'm not sure if they're a doctor or if they're a patient, you know, where do I go to, to kind of get di the diagnosis or the training in that? So you know, if you're a patient, you just want to go to someone who's trained in concussion. Um, the reality is, is that everything from the American Academy of Neurology all the way to the concussion and sport group, who are the authorities in concussion, uh, where they start listing who should be treating and diagnosing concussions, it's a healthcare provider trained in concussion. It's not a specific type of healthcare provider. Uh, it's just someone who's completed training in concussion. So that's where it's really important if you're a patient to do a little background research on your doctor. Find out where they've been trained. And it, you know, just because somebody's seen a bunch of concussion patients, uh, a dentist has seen a bunch of concussion patients, it doesn't necessarily mean they're treating concussions or they're trained to treat concussions. Same thing with a chiropractor. Just because they've seen patients that have had concussions doesn't mean they're trained to, to help them. Um, so always as a patient, be a savvy shopper, investigate your doctor, their education. And from a doctor's perspective, you wanna find a, an educating, uh, an institution 
that has a reputation, a history, a legacy, as well as a good academic program are built around that. So you, it should be transparent. You should be able to see all of the learning objectives in their concussion training course and see if that resonates with you. And, and I'll tell you, um, a quick course isn't necessarily what you want to take because there's so much complexity around concussion. It, it, there is in this depth. And I know you go through it in great detail on how to assess it. But before we get into the assessment, somebody else asked a question. Do concussions heal on their own? I mean, that's a question we get all the time. So, you know, if I hit my head, I bonk it, I have a concussion, is it going to resolve on its own and heal appropriately? Yeah. So I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but I'm so glad we started off with that question. It, does a concussion heal on its own? Well, what is a concussion? So the research right now suggests that yes, most concussions heal on their own. But when you start reading the studies, the, the milestone or the, the measurement tool that they're using to see if concussions healed are symptoms. So symptoms go away. So I think let's take brain out of this and let's ask, does a cut heal on its own? And the answer, absolutely, a cut heals on its own, but does scar tissue remain? So the brain can heal on its own, but does it heal the way you want it to heal? If you had a choice between having a big scar on your face from a cut or no scar, which would you prefer? Well, the brain would prefer not to have any scars either. So what I guess what this metaphor is leaning towards is just because symptoms disappear doesn't mean the brain is functioning as it was prior to the concussion, which means that you need to you or your doctor or uh, whoever is assessing the concussion has to look at more than just symptoms. Because uh, when we start looking at special types of imaging like functional MRI, what we're realizing is only about 23% of all concussions return back to their baseline neurological function after one year. Wow, 23%. So are we talking a little bit about neuroplasticity and not the word that we use so much? It says it's not always positive, it's negative. Do you want to uh, tackle that little one? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a big thing with concussions. Um, you, if you understand the mechanisms of concussion, basically how they work, um, when you have that brain injury, certain parts of your brain go into, we'll just kind of be nice and simple here, like a protective mechanism, like almost like a hibernation. And what ends up happening is, we talked about my five boys. When one of my boys is sick, one of the other boys has to pick up his chores. And what'll end up happening is, for example, if Brady gets sick and Boston's doing his chores, when Brady starts feeling better and Boston's doing a good job at his chores, guess what, he's not gonna do them again. Your brain is the same way. When it starts to remodel, where other parts of your brain start picking up the activities, the parts that were injured, sometimes it doesn't go back, but that is not the most efficient because if Brady is not doing his chores anymore, that means that the, not as many chores can get done. So plasticity is not always a good thing. That remodeling is not always a good thing. It's good when it produces efficiency in brain function and better quality of life. It's not good if it produces poorer quality, quality of life and poorer efficiency. Right, because we hear the term neuroplasticity, nerves and plastic, the brain is so plastic. And uh, I hear a lot of practitioners use it like it's a buzzword and it's great, like you won the lotto. But what you're saying is if I can use some simple terms, there's negative neuroplasticity, negative rewiring the brain, like after concussion that people not treating it, the scar tissue. And then as somebody who may go to you or one of your trained type of practitioners who's going to get a positive neuroplasticity, by the way, my friend just uh, texted me. He's heard the word Boston and Brady, uh, and he's a giant fan. So he just wanted to let you know. That, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. We were talking about this earlier. My uh, one half of my family is from Massachusetts. The other half is from Connecticut. So, you know, we, we gave them some of those uh, <laughs> some of those names. <laughs> Well, if you're above New, New Haven, you're uh, a New Yeah, Haven. exactly. I think that's a line to be a Patriot fan, everybody. And if you're below New Haven, you're usually a Giant or a Jet fan. Yeah, well, you know what? I, I, I said to Trish, I was like, listen, we've got these, uh, you know, with our younger kids. Can we name one of them Jeter? And she's like, there's no way. Wow. <laughs> wow. Right, right to the heart. Right to the heart. <laughs> I know. Man. I know. Um, is there a way to determine if someone will have difficulty re recovering from a concussion? Yeah, actually, there are ways to determine if somebody's going to have difficulty recovering from a concussion, and it mostly has to do with what they brought to the concussion. And what I mean by that is the pre-existing conditions have a large contribution to the outcome of concussions. Um, 
So for example, if you had migraines beforehand or if you had some oxidative stress, you know, as you, you probably talk a lot about on here, I've heard her talk about oxidative stress and, and free radicals and react, reactive oxygen species. If your diet is not good and you know, you're, you're really not eating so healthy and you're not exercising, you're not managing your blood sugar ahead of time, uh, that can predict a poor outcome. Uh, but the number one predictor of poor outcomes with a concussion is altered mental status prior to concussion. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you have either a uh, like prior mental health condition or if you have history of family members with mental health condition, the odds of you having a uh, what we call a protracted persisting concussion symptom is 20 times more than if you didn't. So uh, there are certain things for sure that we need to look at. Age is a factor. Um, mechanism of injury is actually a factor. They, there was a study that found that individuals who felt as though their concussion was intentional, meaning that somebody hit them with a car, somebody punched them, versus that, those that were accidental, the ones that were intentional actually had longer protracted re, uh, resolution than those that were thought to be accidental. So there's a lot of uh, psychological components to this. Not to say that concussions are psychological, they're very much physiological, uh, but they can have uh, other factors that contribute to it. So basically, the starting point of where they are, if they're pre-inflamed, if their inflammation is too high, if kind of like right across the board, and you know, you made a good reference to diet. So I wanted to interject. For me, I found that the ketogenic diet has been very effective. Kind of makes sense. Keto was made in the 1930s for epilepsy. Um, the basis of producing ketone bodies, the gold medal winner in an epigrammatic fashion is without question beta hydroxybutyrate crosses the blood brain barrier. So changing foods, changing lifestyles, you know, getting treated chiropractically, getting examined in a functional neurological sense is a critical element. And I think, you know, I was just interviewed today and they said, what's the biggest problem? It was sort of like long COVID. And I said, everybody's sick. Everybody's starting pre-inflamed, and it's the same thing um, it, with this. So that said, from a doctor's perspective, with concussions being so variable in each person, how do you hit such a moving target? Yeah, no, that's that's a fantastic question. Well, we the way we've kind of done this, let's just say this way: I'm so glad that I'm not a trailblazer in concussion. You know, being the first person to ever see a concussion. I mean, obviously, it's been around since goodness, like the the 1300s. Razi's uh, was one of the first persons to identify a concussion. But you know, the thing what I'm saying is that we now have decades, centuries of experience around concussion, and we can start looking backwards and doing something that we call the factor analysis, right? Where we start looking at what are the commonalities between different subtypes or subclassifications of concussions. And what we've start to realize is that concussion symptoms and signs can start to be um, kind of clustered into different what we call phenotypes. So phenotyping is a big thing. Um, about 10 years ago, there were three concussion phenotypes. We had cognitive, uh, we had affect, and we had somatic. So basically the emotional type of concussion, the physical type of concussion, and the cognitive type of concussion. Now we know there's actually about seven different phenotypes uh, that people can exhibit symptoms of. Now, now nobody ever has one phenotype. There's never just a vestibular type of concussion because people that have vestibular issues get dizzy, and when they get dizzy, they get anxious. And when they get dizzy, they still have neck pain, you know, and so it starts to spread through different phenotypes. But the phenotypes themselves, the seven, six to seven different phenotypes, depending on the reference you're looking at, allows a, a, a clinician to kind of go through check boxes and say, okay, let me check this, let me check that, let me check this to see if it exists. And then we can start narrowing because you don't want to just throw everything against the wall to see what sticks. You want to be purposeful because your patients deserve efficiency. They deserve not to have to have over testing. They deserve not to have to have, you know, experience therapies that don't work. So you can be like laser precise if you start looking and going through all those different phenotypes to see what exists. Yeah, um, that's a great point. It's funny when we were discussing coming on and you spoke about the phenotypes, you know, I, I, I'm prepared for it. So I've got it right here. So the acronym is Coach V. 
So yep. it's cognitive problems, oculomotor dysfunctions, affective disturbances, cervical spine disorders, headaches, cardiovascular, and vestibular abnormalities. So because they both are based on eyes, if you will, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the oculomotor dysfunction yeah. and a little bit about the vestibular, because yeah. I think that's where, I mean, you hang your hat on concussion and functional neurology without question, but those people who are trying to train, those are the two areas that are most uh, difficult for them to grasp. Yeah, and they also are the ones that, in my experience and a lot of other literature, are the most pervasive. I mean, you have the most. So when we um, when we actually have a concussion, uh, we have what's called the diffuse axonal injury, and it has to do with stretching of brain tissue. And the area of the brain that is um, most vulnerable to shear is actually in the brainstem, right? So the brainstem going up from you know your stem of your brain up to the middle of your brain, your your mesencephalon and your thalamus. And it just happens to be that's where the vestibular nuclei live and that's where the oculomotor nuclei live. And what's really interesting when you start talking about vestibular and oculomotor is that if you look through embryological development, um, the vestibular neurological pathways are formed four weeks, four to five weeks after conception. It's the first sensory pathway to be formed. So most women don't even know they're pregnant at that point in time. That's how soon this is. It's like right around the same time that your heart's supposed to be starting to beat. Um, so the reason why I, I make that point is because uh, if you believe in God or whatever that we're created by you know, a force, that force put that first and everything was built on top of that. So when you injure that, it can affect all the different functionality of your brain. And then the next thing that develops is actually oculomotor control. So those two very fundamental or foundational functions are injured pretty often with concussion and they could just create misery in people's lives because uh, the number one most important thing that the brain must do is understand where you are and where space is in relationship to you. And there's two structures that determine that, your vestibular structures and your eyes. Those are the two most important things because gravity, the one universal constant on earth, the thing that's always pulling us perpendicular to the center of the earth should be perceived that way. But if our vestibular structures are off, we're going to start feeling that we're crooked and pulled and dizzy and disoriented and off balance. And then that affects blood flow, that affects digestion, that affects your immune system. All the things we see in astronauts, actually. It's fascinating. And, you know, you mentioned the eyes. We have, as everybody knows, 12 cranial nerves, four of which are totally dedicated to the eyes and two of which have a major impact on, again, uh, so you got six out of 12 cranial nerves. So... Obviously, someone would need to, if you will, the window into the functional neurology like could be examining the eyes. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, it's and that's becoming more prevalent in the literature as well, too, that using um, eye tracking as a biomarker for brain health and concussion is something that's becoming more and more published. Actually, Dr. Carrick just published a paper, um, I think it was just like about six months ago, that looked at eye tracking being able to distinguish people that were blind. They're, they were blinded by who had a concussion and who didn't, and they only looked at eye tracking, and they were able to predict who had concussions and who didn't just looking at their eye tracking. Yeah, it's funny that you bring up how to predict it because so much has been discussed about baseline testing. You just gave eye tracking. Before, you said functional MRI over a structural MRI. Now, I don't yeah. know if everybody listening knows the difference, so maybe we can cover that. And, you know, what is a good baseline test? Why is it so important? Yeah, absolutely. So a good baseline test, to be very simply stated, will tell you where the person was prior to the incident. Um, if, so for example, if my if you did a baseline test of me, because we talked about Coach CV, right, the acronym for the phenotypes, if you only looked at my neck and then said, okay, I did a baseline, and I had a concussion, and my oculomotor, vestibular, uh, affect, and cognitive things were dysfunctional, you didn't measure any of those things prior to my concussion, so you'll never know if I'm, you know, if I've been affected. So, you know, I think one of the things that we always kind of talk about is that you don't know get to how to, you don't know where, excuse me, you don't know how to get back to where you started if you never knew where you were to begin, right? So the thing is, is by having a comprehensive baseline that looks at all those different phenotypes, if you assess one thing in each one of those phenotypes, you're doing more than the what we call the most common uh, concussion baseline, which only looks at cognitive, 
function and a little bit of vestibular function, an oculomotor function. That's you know, that's the most prevalent you know, baseline test that's out there, and it's just not sufficient now that we know all these different phenotypes exist. So a good baseline will just be comprehensive. That's all. Now, obviously, baseline is to get an assessment, then you're going to treat, and then you're going to reassess. Yeah. Well, so the ideal thing, the ideal thing is that, you know, with the variability in the definition of concussions, if we were able to um, kind of put out there the statistics around concussion. You know, for example, uh, when we start actually looking at the incidence of concussion, if we start using the broadest definition and then we start looking at underreporting in people that didn't even know they had a concussion until after you told them, the true incidence, meaning how many concussions actually happen per year, is about one in six. Okay, so one out of every six people will have a concussion every single year. Uh, and if you protract that to the population of the United States, it's astronomical. To give you a little bit of perspective on that, one out of every 12 people will get diagnosed with diabetes sometime in their life. So one out of six people will have a concussion every year, one out of 12 will be diagnosed with diabetes in their life. So we kind of see the magnitude of this. Wow. So by doing baseline concussion testing, by offering a comprehensive baseline, you're going to be able to detect whether somebody had a concussion really easily, but also even if they don't have a concussion, you're going to be able to give them brain health advice saying, hey, you know what? We need to work on this area just to make you a better functioning human being. So it's, it works as a, I don't want to say a double-edged sword, almost like a two-for-one uh, where you can monitor for neurodegenerative conditions or injury, but also make somebody be the best version of themselves as possible. Your best concussion baseline assessment, if you had to give me one, what would you say it is? And I, I, I hate to do that to you. So yeah, if you're I, one I, into one A, I'm happy. I, I wouldn't even be able to do that because there is no one baseline, good baseline concussion assessment. I, I okay, I'll give you, I'll give you a true answer. Mine, <laughs> you know, the one that I do, you know, the one that looks at all the different domains, the one that I teach, uh, the one that I try to tell doctors about, like, hey, these are the different components you need to assess in a baseline in order to be comprehensive and be a good one. Uh, because, and this is not my opinion, the research suggests there is no one good baseline. It just doesn't Excellent. exist. Excellent, so you're gonna pick from the toolbox and you're gonna individualize it and personalize it depending on the phenotype, the athlete, their starting point, outstanding. So what about sports related repetitive head injuries? Yeah. So we have concussion. We also have these sub concussions. Mm -hmm. So many people say, if I do not have a definition of a concussion, it did not do damage to my brain. You care to jump in on that? Yeah, that's just not true. I mean, and once again, I, I don't like to give opinions because I, I don't think that my opinion really matters. I just like to tell you what the best people in the world are saying. Uh, and the smartest people in the world, the people that are doing all the research saying that these subconcussive blows do accumulate. Um, as a matter of fact, there's some research that suggests that subconcussive blows are worse than the concussive blows. Uh, because if you had a really big concussion, you're gonna be out of your sport for a while. You're gonna go through a rehabilitation process most likely to get back to your baseline. Uh, these subconcussive ones, I, you know, I like to tell my patients, uh, you know, we're over here in like sunny Florida where we launch rockets every week. You know, these things, the trajectory is calculated so precisely to get to where they need to be. If a bird, you know, bumps into the rocket on the way up, it may only knock it off one one hundredth of a degree, but protract that out a million miles, you missed your target altogether. So these subconcussive blows are just like birds hitting a rocket going to the moon. Uh, if it's not corrected for, eventually it's going to miss the moon. Uh, so the subconcussive blows are sometimes even more dangerous than the big concussions. And the research kind of supports that as well, too, because they're not addressed. It's fascinating. Now, with these concussions or subconcussions, I'm going to go into the neurological rabbit hole a little bit. I'm going to talk about maybe disrupting the blood brain barrier. Yeah. and disrupting the blood-brain barrier, actually getting an attack on microglial cells and microglial priming and macrophage type 2 and all that. Um, can these concussions and subconcussive blows lead to neuroautoimmunity and neurodegeneration in the brain? I, I mean, I believe so. So, you know, the disruption of the blood-brain barrier, is, it's, it's proven. It happens. It happens due to both the cerebral edema that happens, the impaired vasomotor control, all the things that happen with concussion. But there's some people that suggest that that's a good thing, right? That that's a good thing. That creates a healing process because without that, you don't have 
um, you know, some of the different things like BDNF release, which is the brain drive neurotropic factor. You don't have some of that, uh, the molecules that are, are secreted to cause the brain cells to start hibernate while they can heal. Uh, the big important thing is, is that uh, when that process happens, that it's addressed. Um, and it's kind of like we, we kind of talked about plasticity always having a good connota connotation to it. But we also know that PTSD is a form of plasticity, right? Inflammation is the same thing. And you know this as well, too. Uh, without inflammation, we don't heal. But chronic inflammation causes issues. And what happens with these subconcussive blows is they're always getting a little itty bitty bit of sub uh, sub threshold inflammatory processes going on and they accumulate over time. And, you know, when you start having um, the inflammation there, that's when we start getting uh, poorly, um, poorly formed proteins. We start getting, you know, things that's called tau tangles. And those are the things that eventually lead to things like CTE and dementia and Parkinson's and, and things like that. So it's, a, you know, it's kind of a perfect storm. Not everybody that has subconcussive blows develop those types of neurodegenerative conditions. There's genetic components to it. Like when we start looking at some of our uh, transporter genes, our, lip our lipid transporter genes, like the APOE4 genotype and things like that. Uh, but there's also a whole slew of other um, genetic uh, primers that come into place that actually cause it as well too. So there's, there's a lot there to be still researched, but I think it's fair to say, Dr. Rob, like you were saying that uh, if you have a concussion, you know, like everybody else in the world is saying, you know, 48 hours, just kind of rest. And then the literature is pretty conclusive. After 48 hours, you have to start doing active types of rehab. And that includes, you know, maybe ketones or ketogenic diet that includes, includes anti-inflammatory measures like omega-3 fatty acids and, you know, vitamin D and, and things like that. Things that are going to help get you back to a better situation. Um, and I think that's, that's prudent in order, uh, you know, for someone to have the quickest, the, the most hastened uh, concussion symptoms possible. Yeah, you again, so much to unpack there. We could be here for hours on that, but um, I'm just going to hit you with a couple of additions. I, I know you didn't go through the litany, and you write about the omega 3s, the ketone bodies, pro resolving mediators, choline. Choline, as well, you know, has a tendency to shut off the uh, uh, microglial primate and uh, macrophages of the central nervous system, vitamin D, sulforaphane, magnesium L3 and 8, L glutathione. But I got a question from a friend of mine, and he said he had a concussion about 10 years ago. So it's a two part question. One, is his brain still on fire? And two, is it worthwhile to come to see somebody like you to get assessed and possibly treated at that state? So is the brain still on fire? I mean, uh, Dr. Rob, you could probably answer that better than anybody on this planet almost, um, you know, whether or not that's the case. You know, the reality is, is we don't really know, right? You don't know what you don't look for. So we'd have to kind of figure that out. You know, there's some th pretty simple biomarkers that we could start looking at to see if that's the case. Um, but to, to answer the second question, I've had patients that had concussion-like symptoms for 34 years. Um, and you know, they just thought that that's how it was going to be. And when we're able to kind of evaluate them, we start saying like, okay, we know what normal is. We know what a normal eye tracking motion looks like since we used eye tracking already. Yours are not normal. We know what no vestibular function should look like. Yours doesn't look like that. We know what, you know, your, your neck control should be like. You don't have that. So when we start identifying things that are not functioning, we're never going to be able to say, oh, yes, this was from that concussion that happened 11 years, three months, and seven days ago. We just know that that's not ideal function. And when we start addressing suboptimal function and restore it, people start saying things like, I forgot what normal felt like. You know, or some people start to say, I've got my, own se my old self back. You know, some of the biggest tear jerkers are when you, you treat a patient and their family comes to pick them up at the clinic and the kids start crying because they got their mom or dad back. You know, it's just like, wow, you start realizing the impact that, you know, I'll, I'll say it, just just normalizing somebody's brain can actually have on their life. So, you know, it's never too late. And, you know, I don't think that um, there's been a couple patients that I that I've seen that have had concussions. When we put them through our, our testing, we say. You look completely normal. There's there's nothing we can do here. 
Um, and if that's the case, that's the case. You know, then we start referring to people like Dr. Rob to look at more metabolic stuff or, you know, we start sending them to different folks that might be able to help them a little more. Thank, thank you for the shout out. We got a question uh, from uh, PT. I see that. Can concussions yeah. contribute to mental illness? Can you determine that with testing? So, you know, I think that a, a very broad yes um, can be talked about there. Um, so one of the things that I do with all my patients, if I have the opportunity to baseline screen them, I always administer patient reported outcome measurement tools, uh, like looking at things that health related quality of life. You know, there's something called the BSI 18, which is uh, a pretty generalized screening for mental health. Um, we start looking at, you know, different aspects of mental health prior to their concussion. Uh, and the, where I'm going with this is when I have a patient that has a baseline done, and they uh, have a concussion, we repeat those and almost always, and the research supports this as well, almost always they have a change in their quality of life and they start having increased depression. Uh, and some of it might be appropriate, right? Some of that depression may be like, you know what, I have such a bad headache, I can't pick up my kids anymore. That would make me depressed as well too. So we call it like situational depression, which is appropriate. But once again, that's a mental health issue. And if that becomes protracted because you can't do it, there, that becomes more mental health. And this, this was you know, something that's established a long time ago, the biopsychosocial paradigm, right? Where nothing in the world that affects your biology affects it in isolation. You always have the biopsychosocial combination of the two. Everything from like getting a cold especially nowadays, right? You get a cold and you're coughing and sniffling a little bit. You go out, that's biological. You go out in public and people are thinking you have COVID so they stay away from you. That's social. And that creates a psychological component to you as well too. Like, man, like I don't want to go out in public anymore because people think I'm going to infect them with COVID. So you can see like even something like the common cold has a biopsychosocial interaction, but concussion does as well too, especially because we know that it affects all those different domains, those different phenotypes in some capacity. It's a great question by uh, Martha. So I have one for you. If someone wants to learn more about treating concussion, where can they do that? Well, I'm, I'm completely biased. I mean, all my training was through the Carrick Institute. And of course I've trained, gone to all these different conferences and you know the concussion and sport group meetings and things like that, we're planning to go to that in, in October. Um, you know, but I would say the Carrick Institute really does a great job uh, expanding its reach into multiple different disciplines. Uh, we, we incorporate things from physical therapy. We incorporate things from occupational therapy, from medicine, from functional medicine, from neurology, uh, from psychology. You know, we, we try to really cover all the bases and we're not trying to make somebody a psychologist. We're not trying to make them a physical therapist if they're not. But in, to be able to speak the languages of those different disciplines uh, is the goal of the Carrick Institute because now, once again, I always reference the research, a multidisciplinary approach to concussion is the best approach and that's been proven. So if you yourself, me as an individual, you Dr. Rob, whoever's asking that question, if you can approach a patient which what I call lenses, right? Your chiropractor lenses, you take those off, you put on your physical therapy lenses, you take those off, put on your functional medicine lenses, if you can look at somebody from multiple perspectives, you're gonna get a holistic perspective of them and that's what we try to teach and how to manage concussion. So, you know, I've been teaching for the Carrick Institute now for 11 years, um, you know, we've developed a lot of coursework for them. That's why I say I'm biased, I'm just gonna disclose my bias, uh, but I think they're the best in the world. I, uh, I don't know that many people that would argue with you on that. Like we said, we called it Mount Rushmore. You know, you got to give credit what credit is due. Yeah. Um, if a patient has a concussion and they didn't want to contact you, how can they do that? Oh, I mean, I've got my website, dranzanucci.com. Um, I'm all over social media. Um, it was like a long time ago I created the handle and just stuck with me. Brain Guru um, is the handle. Um, on LinkedIn, uh, you can Google me. I like... There's many different ways to contact me. You can just call the Carrick Institute if you want and say, hey, listen, you know, uh, I'm a patient, not a doctor. I'm hoping to see Dr. Antonucci. The Carrick Institute can kind of get us hooked up. There's so many different ways for us to get connected. Uh, and you know, by all means, it doesn't have to be to, you to be a patient. Just, just ask questions. You know, I, this is my life. I love doing this. A question that comes across 
uh, that I can answer makes my day. Makes my day. I, I just love, you know, educating people, empowering them, inspiring them. Uh, and doctors, I love equipping you to be better doctors. Right. I, I think people don't realize that you're not just treating patients. You're also treating docs in this particular topic. Yeah. And you're, you're treating docs at a very, very high level. I mean, how many hours it is to get a degree or um, a diplomate in uh, neurology with the Carrick Institute? So, yeah, for the Carrick Institute, um, it's 300 continuing education hours. So typically 20 weekends. Uh, in order to be eligible for your board examination. The board examination is pretty tough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, passing rate on it, it's, 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 it's tough. Let's put it that way. Uh, mm -hmm. So if somebody who is a board certified chiropractic neurologist or a fellow uh, of the American College of Functional Neurology, you can kind of take it to the bank that they've done their training. And then in order to be a fellow of uh, the American Board of Brain Injury and Rehabilitation, it's an additional 350 hours. So it, it's definitely a lot of work, and that's uh, that's the program that I just revamped for the Carrick Institute is their um, certification program in brain injury. It's 350 hours. A lot of it is self-paced learning where you basically log online, and when you have time on the weekend or in the afternoon or on your lunch break, you watch some courses and you read some research and you, you interact with us. And then when you get to the end of it, uh, there's an in-person course where we tell you all the live skill acquisition, like how to do the the examination procedures, how to do the therapeutic modalities. Um, and, you know, we have people from all different backgrounds. I'd probably say majority chiropractors, but we've got medical doctors. We've got a lot of physical therapists, athletic trainers that are taking the program. So you know, it's a very robust program and very diverse. Um, and, and our goal is to make it the number one concussion training in the world. And we'll keep making it better until it is. Yeah, I mean, that, that's great to hear about it. I mean, the, the time, the integration, concussion, it's, it's not going away, no pun intended. Yeah. And um, look, I, I know you're really busy. I really appreciate you taking some time to come on with me. We have to do it again. I know there'll be a part two in there. And uh, maybe we'll talk about torticollis and dystonia the next time also. We'll kick that in there. I'd be happy to. That's great. Well, I appreciate it. Dr. Matt Antonucci. I'm Dr. Rob Silverman. Always yours in health. Thanks, Dr. Silverman.